<clears throat> so yeah, I am. I, I am going to to talk about uh, some novel applications that uh, we we like to think that they go beyond the meta barcoding. That is, uh, well, it's basically about inferring the interspecies diversity that is hidden in the uh, meta barcoding data and then uh, trying to to extract the some um, phylogeographical information from from these uh, these sequences and um, and try to get some insights uh, with a possible application to to conservation and ecosystem management. Uh, okay, so uh, right now I am working at the University of Toronto as a scenario at all, but uh, the, the work that I'm going to present uh, would have been impossible without the participation of other people from the, well, from the, uh, the CEAP in Blanes in Spain, University of Barcelona and the University of Salford and Liverpool. John Moore's University. Okay, <clears throat> so then the uh, outline of this talk, uh, I, I am going to, to talk a little about the recent history of, of environmental DNA. And uh, I, will, I will try to, well, to highlight the, the, main, the main results that, uh, that we, we have <clears throat> learn uh, in this like a little more than 12 or 13 years. Uh, as you know, the eDNA research is uh, quite a, a, a recent uh, field of, of ecology, but it's, uh, it's incredible the, the results that we have achieved in, in such a sh short time. Uh, I, I, I will try to <clears throat> to make a brief in introduction of these results and uh, especially focusing on what uh, kind of information we are still missing. <clears throat> um, we can retrieve from uh, our uh, environmental DNA metabarcoding data sets. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, what I am going to talk in the, in the second part uh, of this talk I'm going to present. I hope not, uh, to be not too, not too boring with the uh, bioinformatics part, <laughs> I, I promise. But uh, well, I will present some uh, basics of the, the methods that, uh, that we are currently using. Uh, we are developing to retrieve the robust uh, information about haplotypes from, from raw sequencing data. And then, uh, well, I will introduce some um, current uh, work that uh, we are developing, uh, trying to introduce new metrics for this uh, new field that we have been, we have called metaphylogeography. It's like inferring phylogeographical uh, patterns from uh, hundreds of species at the same time. Well, uh, <clears throat> First, uh, how, how all of this started, the environmental DNA, uh, we, can, we can say that uh, everything started with this uh, short letter uh, in uh, 2008, <clears throat> like uh, from uh, Fichetola and collaborators, where well, they introduced this crazy idea that they could detect the one the, the presence of uh, of a vertebrate by sampling uh, water, mm -hmm. by extracting the, the DNA uh, from filtered water and uh, trying to amplify. Uh, in this case, they use a specific primers for this single species, this uh, bullfrog, that is an uh, invasive species in in Europe. And uh, well, they they reported that they they could robust robustly uh, infer the presence of this species by by sampling uh, water. Well, this idea escalated quickly, <laughs> and uh, currently, uh, well, these are the 
the number of published paper every year uh, using the words environmental DNA in Google Scholar. We are almost reaching 5,000 papers a year. That is more than 12 papers daily. So we, we have passed the point where um, a researcher can, can be completely uh, updated by reading everything that is published on environmental DNA. Actually, we, we uh, passed this point several years ago already. And uh, this is uh, the, a picture taken uh, two years ago during the Code of Life conference in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, we had, I think it was almost 2,000 researchers uh, communicating uh, things about the, well, results about the, the DNA barcoding. But uh, I, I have chosen this, this picture because this conference uh, marked the point where the most of the, of the presentations uh, was based in uh, high throughput sequencing data. So uh, uh, it was actually based on meta barcoding data. So <clears throat> I guess that uh, we will soon need to, to change the, <laughs> the name of the conferences, the meta barcode of life conference. <clears throat> but well, the thing is that this uh, field is growing fast. Uh, as you know, is uh, one of the most, uh, well, of the f fasting, uh, f fastest growing fields in, in ecology right now. And uh, this is because of the, the powerful, <coughs> the, the power to detect, uh, to retrieve robust environmental data uh, from many, many different uh, systems. So uh, as a short story, I can tell that, uh, well, by 2011, uh, the group in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, has proved that uh, we can retrieve uh, um, presence of, uh, of uh, several, uh, several vertebrates from environmental samples. <clears throat> they were uh, still using uh, single species uh, primers here, but then uh, quickly they go into using uh, universal primers, and that is where the metabarcoding uh, met with environmental DNA. And then by using these uh, universal primers from an uh, environmental sample, then uh, we can retrieve a treasure of information about, uh, well, the, all, uh, all of the sequences, uh, traces in the environment that can be amplified with these primers can be retrieved and analyzed. And in this uh, metabarcoding data, there is a lot of information. And, uh, one interesting, uh, interesting information is that the number of reads, the number of uh, sequences uh, detected in, in, uh, in our samples are somehow correlated with the abundance of the species. This is a, a still a hot topic of discussion in environmental DNA. I, I will try to, to clarify it a little in this talk, but uh, indeed there, there is some kind of, uh, of relation uh, between the quantification of the species. Um, you can have uh, several metrics for quantifying a species, but uh, well, in this case, it was the, uh, the detection of the fish in the troll nets <clears throat> and, the, and the number of metabarcoding rates. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, later on, uh, we, we uh, prove that the environmental DNA and metabarcoding is useful to detect elusive megafauna such as uh, sharks. Uh, sharks are uh, quite difficult to, 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 well, to detect using conventional methods because they, are, they tend to be uh, elusive. They run away from, <laughs> from, from mankind. And then, uh, well, uh, in, in these two papers, uh, um, we prove that using environmental DNA metabarcoding uh, well, it's, uh, it's 
um, is a technique that is more um, that that you, you can detect more sharks than using conventional techniques. And also uh, an interesting thing is that uh, you can retrieve ecological um, patterns, ecological information. Like for example, uh, there is a correlation between the anthropogenic impact and the abundance uh, of metabarcoin risk and the motor richness that you retrieve. So uh, uh, environmental DNA information can be also used to infer uh, ecological patterns. Uh, regarding the, the diversity of uh, ecosystems, well, uh, the eDNA approach has been applied to basically all the ecosystems in the world, from the deep sea uh, sediments to uh, airborne communities from high mountains. So uh, you can um, also filter the air, and then you can retrieve the, the DNA from this filter and you can amplify yeah, and, and, and you can study these uh, communities that are living uh, in the air. And uh, of course, uh, uh, well, the eDNA techniques are more uh, cost effective and affordable, so it can be uh, used at, at a very high scale. So you can uh, do global scale biodiversity surveys like uh, this one that was uh, was done using the, the samples retrieved during the Tara Ocean expedition. And uh, well, they, they basically measure the biodiversity of, uh, of zooplankton worldwide using a eating S marker. And this kind of global information is beginning to be shared in, in public um, data systems. So one nice example is this uh, global fungi uh, database that uh, <clears throat> is actually, uh, well, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, one of the developers it is Daniel Moraes, <laughs> that is a, is a Brazilian scientist. It's a, it's a, he, he, he's, uh, he's currently working in, in the Czech Republic, I think, but uh, well, it's interesting that we see that uh, we have eDNA data for fungi from all over the world, but uh, still there are some regions that are clearly underrepresented. Now this, uh, South America is this uh, gray uh, piece, and, uh, and there is, uh, even if the developer is Brazilian, there is a big hole in the middle of, uh, of South America. So yes, there is still a, a lot of work to do, but now we, we have the tools. <clears throat> and uh, some of the things that we have learned from these uh, 12 or 13 years that we have been working with eDNA are this. Uh, the first one is that, uh, yes, we can detect multiple species from eDNA samples using eDNA metabarcoding and universal primers. Then there is some correlation of, uh, with the species abundance. So we can retrieve information about the species abundance, uh, either in uh, using read abundance or relative read abundance or the rate of positive detection in our samples. There are different ways so, to get this uh, abundance information. Uh, the third uh, point is that the uh, once and again, we have proof that the mythos based on the environmental DNA are more efficient than conventional surveys. Every time that we compare a um, conventional census technique with eDNA, the eDNA wins. <clears throat> and uh, well, we have proof that these results can be used to infer ecological information, um, uh, also to, to perform environmental assessments. So this uh, opens, uh, uh, the way to a uh, lot of new tools for, for environmental assessment that are also cost effective. And so they, they can be applied uh, at a fraction of the cost that a conventional survey would, would take. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the good thing that the, uh, the similar methods can be applied to assess 
uh, virtually all the ecosystems on Earth. So we don't need to invent anything new. We, we can use the same primers, we can use same uh, molecular biology lab techniques, and we can use the same bioinformatics to uh, uh, assess and to get information about all of these ecosystems. So, but there is an important reminder here. <laughs> this is a, a, a picture that uh, Kisti Deiner uh, likes to, to show in her talks. And uh, it's that the eDNA is not a method. eDNA uh, is actually a material. eDNA is a physical thing that is present in the environment. So uh, if somebody says that, uh, well, eDNA don't, doesn't work for my problem, then uh, this is not <laughs> a, a right sentence to, to do. It's a, the eDNA is there and you can retrieve this, this information. It's a, probably if you don't get this information it's because you are not using the right tool, but you can develop a new tool to analyze this, this eDNA and, and you can retrieve this information. Um, actually, a big source of confusion for many people starting to work with eDNA is that uh, we are um, calling eDNA to different things uh, sometimes. Uh, so basically we can say that every environmental DNA sample is actually a combination of two fractions that are basically uh, inseparable. So uh, the environmental DNA is by definition, is the DNA that you can extract from an environmental sample. And this DNA uh, is always a combination of this, what we call trace DNA, that is basically extra organismal DNA that is present in very low concentrations, and the community DNA of the, the living, uh, the community of living organisms that are uh, living in the sample. No? They can be bacteria, but they can be micro eukaryotes and they, they can be uh, pa body parts of recently the dead, uh, bigger things. <clears throat> uh, but the, the, the idea is that the concentration of this uh, community or organismal DNA is orders of magnitude higher than the extra organismal DNA. And uh, there's, there's been some confusion because some researchers were calling eDNA and they were referring the extra organismal fraction, while some other researchers were calling eDNA when they were talking about the community DNA fractions. And uh, well, until recently, uh, <clears throat> I think that we have uh, contributed to clarify the, the situation a little. Uh, in this, uh, this paper recently published with a lot of collaborators uh, that, uh, well, <clears throat> the thing is that the, there is basically two different ways of work with uh, environmental DNA, depending on if we are targeting, if we are interested in the organismal DNA fraction or we are interested in the extra organismal DNA fraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that these two fractions are physically uh, inseparable for now. Using physical uh, methods, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot enrich uh, your uh, environmental DNA sample in extra organismal DNA. There is no physical way to do that for now. So the, the way to enrich that is to using more specific primers that are uh, amplifying the, the target uh, that you are interested in. And uh, yeah, the thing is that the kind of information that you can retrieve is uh, different in <clears throat> uh, from extraorganismal DNA since you are targeting very low target DNA, uh, then you will have the low repeatability in your PCR amplification. So that will mean that the, the results of the PCR will be stochastics. You need many PCR replicates to get your robust information. 
and then you will have uh, some problems with the contaminations and the presence of false negative in the plant. Uh, all of this is a, well, I like this analogy of the, the needle uh, and, and the haystack. Uh, when you are targeting extra organismal DNA, for example, when you are targeting to amplify shark DNA in a water sample, then it's like uh, looking for the needle in the, in the haystack. Mm, so you need a lot of uh, trial and an error and a lot of replication to get robust information if you can uh, robustly say if there are is uh, needles or not in the hay. <clears throat> but while um, targeting organismal DNA is is like analyzing the hay itself, no. So uh, if you take a sample of the hay, then you will uh, have a high repeatability in your results. The PCR will be deterministic, so basically you will get the same. Um, the same results uh, if you do many replicates. Uh, that means that uh, there is no point in doing a lot of PCR replicates when you're target targeting organismal DNA and you can invest your money in taking more ecological replicates instead of uh, doing more PCR replicates. Okay, so with this in mind, um, uh, mm, this is determined, uh, the, if we are working with extra organismal DNA or community DNA, it will, be, will depend on the primers that we are using to amplify that. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, spectrum between specificity and universality of metabarcoding primers. So basically for extra organismal DNA, uh, we will require uh, primers that have the high specificity, for example, if we want to amplify the fish in our sample, then we will need some uh, primers that are specific for fish. But for organismal DNA, in the opposite, uh, we will require universality in our primers so that our primers will amplify uh, everything, every single species that is present in the sample. No? Uh, and this is somehow contradictory because, uh, for example, if I am interested in fish diversity, I want a specific primers for fish, but also universal primers for fish. So I want a primer, a perfect primer that is able to amplify only the fish, but uh, all the fish species. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, you cannot have both. Mm -hmm especially in the case of hypervariable markers, such as CO1. Uh, CO1 is, uh, has two, well, not too many, but a big, <laughs> a high uh, natural variability in the sequences. So uh, basically, if you want to design universal primers for amplifying CO1 from all the fish species, then you will need to introduce uh, uh, degenerate bases in your primers, and then they will inevitably uh, amplify other things, you know, like non-specific amplifications. And this is the reason that uh, where the CO1 and metabarcoding were not considered a, a good match. <laughs> there is a, this classic uh, a paper of Diegel and collaborators. Uh, also, uh, well, our group also shown that uh, CO1, using CO1 in uh, extra organismal DNA metabarcoding was not a very good idea because uh, uh, most of the, of the risk came from non-specific amplification of bacteria and microeukaryosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, one interesting thing is that we try to use extra organismal DNA in the title here, like uh, three years ago. Um, we were not allowed. Some review were told us that uh, this extra organismal DNA was not uh, <laughs> understandable. And then we, we, we had to change to environmental DNA. But uh, uh, while this, uh, this paper was specifically uh, uh, talking about extra organismal DNA. You know? This is how the, the confusion was. 
Okay, <clears throat> so, but, uh, but we want to use CO1 because there, there is something naturally uh, interesting in CO1. It's the high taxonomic resolution. The high, hyper variability of CO1 means that the sequences that we are going to amplify will, will have, uh, well, will be, uh, will have such a high taxonomy resolution that we will be able to, uh, to get information uh, be, uh, be below the species level. No? So we can recover haplotype information, intraspecific information. Uh, well, this is a comparison of what you can get for uh, sea urchins using a 18S marker. And you see that all of these species of sea urchins will have exactly the same 18S sequence. So basically, um, this is useless for getting any uh, taxonomic resolution for C archins. But for CO1, you, you can have not, all, not only the species perfect, like, perfectly delimited, but also the intraspecific level. And uh, well, so, the, we can use CO1. Um, it's not good for detecting extra organismal DNA, let's say, but we can use it for organismal community DNA, provided that we can find the right universal primers. And I think that we can, uh, we have found them. <laughs> so there is uh, uh, this uh, Lerae XT primer set that include a lot of uh, degeneration. If you see every three bases, there is a, a degenerate position. Uh, uh, with this, uh, we can amplify uh, 313 base pairs of CO1 that uh, uh, allows us to recover interspecific diversity. Uh, we have used these primers in many, many different uh, systems. Uh, the first time that we used them was to uh, explore these uh, hard bottom venti communities. Uh, so basically taking a, a sample of this quadrat of seaweed community, blending it and amplifying with CO1. And we uh, detected more than 20,000 different models. So it's uh, crazily variable. Mm -hmm. And uh, using these, these same markers, we, well, we have studied the, the influence of ocean acidification by a volcanic CO2 vent in the La Palma Island. This, um, by the way, it's, uh, right now it's, there is a volcano in eruption going on. It's uh, our sampling site is a little to the south of the volcano, so it's safe for now. But uh, yeah, the, the thing is that we retrieved ecological information the, um, of how this ocean acidification um, uh, affects the, the venti communities and the calcifying algae. With the same primers, we can also study the high mountain pit box. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, study, but I don't mean the, in the Pyrenees, well, we, we showed that uh, we have, we can retrieve ecological information uh, about this, uh, this pit box, and not only from other samples, but also from uh, paleoecological samples up to some millions of years old. Okay, and recently we also shown that using these primers, the results are somehow quantitative. So using this these primers for zooplankton communities, you can get a nice correlation between the number of reads and the and the abundance. So this is the number of reads that you get. This is the biomass of the different species in the samples, and then you can get basically robust quantitative information for zooplankton analysis. And uh, even you can use these primers for uh, trophic metabarcoding. Uh, this is a nice work that we did uh, in, uh, with uh, six different species of, some, uh, of bats from Madagascar. Um, 
well, we 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 proved that the, they were feeding on on, on pest insects. That is uh, interesting, and all of this was done using uh, the uh, the same the CO1 little AXT primer set. And the thing is that all of these uh, works have been used in the species level, like the model level, but uh, these data sets uh, still contain a lot of more uh, intraspecific information. So we can uh, also retrieve the haplotypes that are hidden in these metabarconi data sets. So what is the problem? The problem is that these data sets also have many, many errors, many random errors that come from PCR and the sequencer. And uh, it's very difficult to distinguish the true variability, uh, the, the nature, the natural variability in the samples from the random errors introduced by the, by the um, instrument. So um, basically there are two ways of deal with these errors. Uh, one is a clustering. Uh, with clustering, you have a initial uh, raw data set that is, uh, these are the real sequences, uh, the natural sequences, and all of these uh, smaller circles will be the errors. And then by clustering, you will uh, cluster all of these sequences into a single one that is called a, a motu. And then we, we are not interested in the variability within this motu. So this motu for us is just like a, counting as one unit of diversity. Uh, but we can also use the noisy methods. In the denoising method, uh, in principle, you can retrieve, uh, well, all of these uh, errors will be added to their mother sequences. And then you can retrieve the uh, the original natural um, sequences present in the sample. And then you, instead of motus, you can use uh, several uh, ways. The ASV, for example, is amplicon consequence variance. There are several denoising algorithms going on. <clears throat> Probably the two more uh, most used are the UNOIS and DADA2. Uh, they use different names. They also, uh, in you know, is the different sequences are called SOTUS, like zero radio OTUS. In data two, they are called amplicon sequence variants, but they are basically the same thing. So the idea is to retrieve the original sequences uh, in, in our samples. And this would be typically be uh, intra uh, species uh, sequence. Because uh, in natural, in, in nature, in our samples, there will be probably several haplotypes for, for the same species. Um, okay, so the problem <clears throat> is that the performance of these denoising algorithms uh, depends on uh, some adjustable parameters, and the, there is a trade off between removing most of the errors and keeping the true haplotypes. But these parameters have been optimized uh, usually for bacterial 16S markers. So uh, this started with a microbiologist using a 16S marker to uh, study more communities of bacteria. And then, well, they have optimized the methods to, to retrieve the, the bacterial uh, diversity that they put into these small communities. But when you try to apply these uh, to eukaryotic markers uh, without modifying the parameters, then um, you can get uh, two kinds of errors. No? You can have over denoising or you can have under denoising. And we have uh, examples of these two things <clears throat> in recent uh, papers, for example, the, in this paper, there was a mock community with 15 different haplotypes and, uh, well, op trying to optimize you noise to the, the noise, this data set, uh, you get only nine. <clears throat> so basically six of the haplotypes were removed. They were clearly over denoising. And uh, 
other <clears throat> other studies, for example, this instead of using the CO1, they are using the control region of the mitochondrion that is still more variable. And uh, well, if you try to denoise uh, all of this data, then either using data two or using you know is uh, you cannot remove all the all the the artifacts haplotypes. No, the, these are the 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 real uh, sequences, the real haplotypes. So this is clearly a, a case of under denoising. And uh, well, uh, we notice that we have uh, another. <clears throat> We have another source of information here that we have not used, and is the fact that the CO1 is a coding marker. So that means that uh, for CO1, uh, we have every three bases, it's a codon. And there is some uh, kind of information in the natural variability in codon positions. So we know that uh, the third position of every codon is more variable because uh, the, it is a synonym uh, mutation. So the third position of the codon can accumulate uh, natural mutations freely or almost freely, but the uh, mutations in the first and the second codon are more rare. So uh, basically we can study the natural variability considering this one, the first, the second, or the third position of every codon and then when when we sequence these natural uh, um, well DNA sequences, and then we add some random error, we see that the random error um, will not affect the third position because it's basically saturated with uh, with random <laughs> positions already, uh, but it will affect uh, greatly the, the first and the second position. So. Uh, the idea is to that we can use a, we, we call entropy ratio that is the entropy ratio in the third position divided by the entropy in the in the second position and then we can track uh, we can use this to optimize the value of the parameters of the denoising uh, protocol procedure. So, uh, for example, uh, if we change the value of this alpha parameter in you noise, we will see that this entropy ratio starts uh, very high, but then it arrives to a uh, well to a, to, a, to a plateau where this zero twenty four is not uh, significantly decreasing anymore. And then we can also use the same criterion for the deciding uh, abundance threshold. So in this, uh, well, if we remove all the haplotypes that have less than a given number of reads, then we see that after a number of reads, then this entropy ratio stays constant. And then uh, we can use this criterion to decide which values of the parameters are right to, to go from this, this row sequence variants, these are all the different uh, sequences that are present in our data set after, after quality filtering. So the, this is after, uh, after the first quality filtering, we are still have a lot, like uh, hundreds or thousands of different variants uh, within a MOTU. And then we want to denoise it and into a haplotype network that uh, depicts uh, only the naturally occurring sequences. Well, uh, the thing is that this uh, work, <clears throat> these are some examples of the haplotype network that we got from our data set uh, that was, uh, well, this, the colors uh, here is the origin of the Mediterranean or Atlantic samples. These are the uh, uh, benthic organisms. And the good uh, news is that we have uh, a way of ground truth in this approach because we have two species in our data set that, uh, that have uh, known phylogeographic patterns. So uh, this is a Mediterranean sea archim paracentrotus. This is the um, haplotype network that we got from our um, metabarcoding data set. And this is the real haplotype network 
that were um, obtained for the same two localities uh, in this paper using classical uh, sequencing. So the basically the topology of the network is the same and the most common haplotypes are exactly the same. And uh, for a second species, this is the network that we use, that we got for, uh, from our metabar coding. And this is the network that uh, we knew from the classical uh, final geography. So um, basically the information that we can retrieve is the same information that we can get from a very, uh, well, from a study that requires uh, hundreds of individuals taken from several localities. And the, the good news is that we can retrieve this information for hundreds of species simultaneously. So we have a way of retrieving this information. Uh, then <clears throat> there is another question here is uh, um, we have to decide whether uh, use a clustering approach or a denoising approach in our method. And, uh, the first metabarcoding pipelines uh, use uh, motus. So um, we cluster into motus and then we study the diversity of motus. But now, especially from the data, do, data two, uh, uh, and, and you know, is the, the metabarcoding data sets are more uh, focused on the noising. So you retrieve the ES, uh, ESV level. But the thing is that you do the analysis uh, with the, this ESV table uh, in the same way as if it were a motu table. And um, we think that this is uh, basically uh, not correct because it's a uh, different information. So the motu level is like the species level information and is the, the unit of classical ecological analysis is the species, it's not the haplotype. Hmm? So for retrieving alpha diversity patterns, beta diversity patterns, bio, biogeographical patterns of distribution of species, and uh, all of these ecological indices, they are based at the species level. When you do a morphological microscopic uh, inventory, you work at the species level, then uh, you should work with a motu table not with an uh, ESV table. The ESV table contains a different kind of information. So uh, you can retrieve appropriate networks, population genetics, connectivity between localities. This kind of information that is, uh, comes from the population genetics field. Hmm? So the thing is that uh, um, uh, a good metabarcoding pipeline uh, should include this. So the, from the data set, from the initial data set, we should have uh, both. You, we should have a motu table to do the ecological analysis, and we should retrieve the ESV table to work at the haplotype level analysis. And currently there is no, no uh, um, single, Metabarcoding pipeline that, uh, is able to do this. If, uh, all of them retrieve either MOTU or ESV, but not both. And then, uh, well, we want to change this, and uh, we are developing this Mjolnir pipeline. <coughs> Mjolnir pipeline, uh, the idea is to integrate in the same pipeline, you uh, input the raw data, and then you will get both tables, the MOTU table and the ESV table. And uh, well, <clears throat> it's uh, freely available. Uh, you can uh, uh, download it from our GitHub. And it's working in R, that is a uh, more common uh, language for that most ecologists are familiar with. And then, well, in the future versions, uh, Mjolnir uh, will integrate not only the pipeline, but also the ecological analysis in R. That is a, is a very good thing that is developing R. Uh, but, well, <clears throat> um, you have to stay, uh, uh, 
well, to look for the, the new developments. B basically, we have not included this ecological analysis yet because we are developing the kind of analysis that are good for this data. And this is the last part of, the, of, of this talk. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's basically the doctoral uh, thesis of uh, Adria Antique, that is, is working in, in Lannes. <clears throat> And, uh, well, it's about developing uh, novel metrics for the metaphilogeographical analysis. So uh, trying to incorporate all of this information into summary uh, metrics, summary numbers, that uh, where we can uh, retrieve some uh, ecological uh, insights. No? So uh, we are working in this, uh, this project that is called, well, there are like two, two projects, Pop Comics and Martech. And this is, this is the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, and this is the Alboran Sea, and this is Almeria, that is the city where I was born. <laughs> And uh, the idea here is that we, we retrieve samples of 20 communities all along the Iberian Mediterranean coast in three areas. Uh, area one is the Alboran Sea, area two, and the area three is the Catalonia. And then uh, in, this, in this area, there are two barriers, two oceanographic barriers that are very well known. One is the Almeria Oran front, that is a very strong barrier. And the other is the Ibiza uh, canal, that is a softer barrier. That, that means that uh, phylogeographical studies here, sometimes they show differentiation for some species and other times they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to, uh, to see if our phylogeographical methods on metabarcoding data will retrieve, will help us retrieving this information about this two oceanographic barriers. So <clears throat> basically there are three levels of analysis here. One is the MOTU table. Uh, the other is the ESV table, so that it's uh, using the, all the ESV as, as, as they come from the denoising uh, procedure. And the other is the GST. The GST is a measure of population differentiation that is widely used in population genetics. Mm -hmm. But uh, the difference here is that we have a G, not a single GST for one species, but we have GST for hundreds of species. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, in, this, in this study, we focus on metazoans. So we remove all the, the other eukaryotic uh, films. Also, this is a, there is a, a still a lot of information in uh, seaweeds and uh, microalgae. But uh, we wanted to study metazoans because we are more familiar with metazoa and uh, uh, retrieve about 600 different motus of metazoans. And for all of them, we got the haplotype networks. Uh, here, the colors uh, means the three different areas. Some of them are clearly differentiated. For example, these haplotypes are more common in the south. These haplotypes are more common in the center. And for some other species, there is no apparent differentiation, like this one that uh, is present in the three areas in similar uh, frequencies. So from these haplotypes, uh, we can uh, develop new metrics. Uh, one is this, uh, well, the GST distribution for the 600 metazoans. And for example, in this plot, we see the distribution of the, this GST. Uh, remember that the GST is a measure of differentiation, genetic differentiation. So the, the higher the value is, uh, the more differentiated the population is. It's like the genetic flow is, uh, uh, is impossible between, between the two areas. And then uh, what we see here is that uh, these are the pairwise comparisons within the area within the area one, this is a population one with population two, and then we have this GST, then population two with a population three, and we have this GST and so on. So the populations, the pairwise comparison within the area uh, retrieve low values for GST, and then the comparison between 
two different areas, for example, this population with this across the barrier of the armory out in front, then uh, you retrieve a lot uh, of uh, increase in the, the GST. So basically, uh, you can see that these populations are within the same area, so the, the, uh, they are uh, mixed, they, are, they freely uh, reproduce with each other, but there is an increase in the GST values when we cross our oceanographic bar. And then the thing is that uh, we can also quantify the strength of this barrier. So this Almeria or front will be uh, stronger than the Ibiza canal uh, front because the GST values uh, are higher. Okay, so we are currently working in this. There is a lot of information. Uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, we could use, for example, different taxa not only metathoans, we could use microalgae, we could use uh, amoebas, we could, we could use uh, seaweeds. Uh, all of them have different uh, reproductive uh, uh, traits. So um, then we can do more uh, particular analysis on the, considering the different uh, <clears throat> reproductive uh, life history of the, of the species, for example. No? So the, the, it's a, uh, is well, it's never ending. Uh, well, some ideas to take home, and with this, I hope to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to finish is that, uh, well, we can retrieve these metaphalogeographic patterns for hundreds of uh, species uh, simultaneously, and uh, we will need to develop these multi species metrics because there is uh, a lot of information that we can use uh, in, uh, in, in these data sets. And uh, well, with this, uh, I, uh, I, I finish this talk. Uh, I would like to say thank you to collaborators in the UIT, but also in the CEAB, the University of Barcelona, La Laguna in Tenerife, and then uh, my previous collaborators in Salford in the Liverpool Jones Moore and Bristol University. And thank you, all, all of you. Um, well, <laughs> sorry for the time. I think that I, I, I occupied a little more time than I expected, but uh, I am open for some questions now. No problem, Whoa, and thank you very much. I'm still processing <laughs> <laughs> all the information you just gave us. <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> lot, of, lot of good ideas and you know, possibilities to think of. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. We, so, we, we, have, we have a few questions here already, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, we have a question from Gabriel, but I think you answered him already, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Who was asking, uh, why not deal with sequencing errors using ah. both the noise <laughs> and clustering? And then you showed the... Exactly. <laughs> you, you made your question too, too early. <laughs> <laughs> too <Yes>. early. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We, are, we agree that the right way to do that is to use both methods. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can retrieve uh, different information. And then uh, with the motor information, uh, you get basically an inventory of a species. And then with a species inventories, you can you can do some ecological uh, analysis, but with the ESV uh, table, then uh, it, it's a table for population genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, the, the thing is that uh, may, many researchers are using this in, uncritically, and then they get the ESV table from data too, and they do the ecological analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we think that this is, uh, this is not right. Because uh, if you do this, then you are giving more weight in your ecological analysis to the species that, are, that have more haplotypes. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you have a polyket with 500 haplotypes, and then you have a bival with only two haplotypes. Then for the ecological analysis at the, at the ESB level, uh, the, the polyket will, will overwhelm the analysis. Mm -hmm. And all the, well, the ecological values uh, the ecological differentiation, Bray Curtis, metrics, all of this will be driven by the polyket and not by the species. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree.
<laughs> we have another question from Katya. Mm -hmm. She said, thank you for your talk. <laughs> Do you think thank you. is it possible to separate extra organismal mm -hmm. DNA by using different size filters for marine water? That's a good question. This, yes, this has been tried. Um, basically, it's, it's impossible because uh, the extra organismal DNA is not free DNA. It's, it usually is attached to, to particles like sand particles, clay, uh, and th these particles are actually quite uh, quite big. They are many times they are bigger than the organismal than the micro eukaryotic organismals. Uh, and then, um, well, basically, in, there is uh, we we still don't have this. Uh, this method that is able to physically separate these two kinds of DNA. There are some methods that we have been using, like uh, extracting uh, extracellular DNA using phosphate, <laughs> for example. I have used it in my, in my first papers. We, uh, we used to, to do like a soft uh, incubation with phosphate and then we analyzed that and we thought that it was the extracellular DNA, but it is not actually true. That is, a, that is that still has a lot of micro eukaryotic DNA because, the, uh, well, it's basically it's impossible. The only way to, to separate that for now is using uh, primers. And that means that uh, using metabarcoding and not a shotgun sequencing. Basically, when, we, when you do shotgun sequencing, you will get both. You will get organismal DNA and you will get extra organismal DNA. There is no other way for now. Maybe in the future. <laughs> I have, we have another question here, but before asking that one, we try to build more communities using genomic DNA, mm -hmm. as I mentioned to you before. Mm -hmm. And when we sequence, we got several, but we include one, only one genomic DNA per species. And when mm. we sequence those, uh, this um, DNA using metabarcoding primers, 12S, we got several ESVs. <laughs> Yeah, how, how is it possible? <laughs> Be, because uh, many of them are actually pseudogenes. Pseudogenes, uh, you reckon? Yes, yes, they are mitochondrial uh, genes that migrated to the nucleus and then they have evolved freely, mm -hmm. not random. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And your primers still can amplify them. Mm -hmm. So, this is a, a known problem. This, uh, the, the presence of these NUMs of uh, uh, pseudogenes or um, uh, nuclear sequences from mitochondrial origin. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and the problem is that we, 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 we still don't know. Uh, we know that they are widespread in the genomes, but uh, until we do the whole sequence of the whole genome, then we, we don't know uh, how important this problem is in, in, a, in the different species. No? We know very well the human pseudogenes, but uh, we have no idea of, uh, let's say, the, the beetle pseudogenes. We, <laughs> we don't know how, how frequent they are. No? Mm -hmm. Um, well, this is something that will be uh, corrected in the future as, uh, with this uh, Earth Biogenome project that is aiming to, um, to sequence uh, the whole genomes of um, millions of organisms. And then we will know a little more about pseudogenes. Yeah. But yes, this is a, a big origin. This is actually intra-individual diversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's a, a part of the, of the diversity that is retrieved in our data set. It's not only the in, interspecies and the in, intraspecies, but also intra-individual. Yeah, I think that's a problem when you use ASV as a proxy for species diversity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. and I are, we are, you know, Iron as well, we are working, working on a paper about that. And it's, it's interesting, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the, the thing is that the, 
using 12s or 18s markers, then you have no really a good way to 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 identify a pseudogene that uh, from, from the right mito, mitochondrial gene. But uh, using CO1, you can, because it's a coding region. <laughs> and then you can look for uh, stop codons. Codons, and, yeah. And then but you can with, remove that. Mass. Yeah, but with the 12S. Yeah, we'll with the 12S until, until you get the whole genome of many individuals of every single species then uh, well we can look at the abundances and at the pattern of uh, of presence absence of this sequence and uh, well and there is this uh, lulu algorithms that is able to to identify these pseudogenes mm -hmm. it's a, it's incorporated in the miolni one of the step of the miolni is the removal of pseudogenes using lulu mm -hmm. if i could just jump in for a second in the same topic you mentioned that you're going to uh, be increasing or including in the pipeline about the population genetics. And the pipeline yes. does already include uh, some information, not only for CO1, but for 12S and 18S, if I'm not wrong, mm. right? And all... Are you also considering to include some of those for the 12S? Yes, this can be used, but uh, the only thing is that you cannot use the entropy ratio correction. Then you can use uh, UNOIS. Uh, it, well, it's, it's, it's the same, you know, is that uh, is down in uh, in the pipelines uh, uh, of you search, and then then you you will get a ASB table, uh, but uh, using you noise and not the denoisy, <laughs> mm -hmm. so not the entropy ratio. But uh, yes, it will be. Uh, well, you will retrieve an ASB table, and then the, in, in, in principle, you can use it also for population genetics. Mm -hmm. But mm. yeah, well, I think we have to uh, move on because our mm -hmm. I, well, our time just <laughs> run out of time. <laughs> but Sorry about we, that. We have so many so many questions to ask you. I think we're gonna yeah. ask you. <laughs> For another <laughs> I can I, I, I can try to answer some of them in the chat. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, yeah. Owen. You know, it was very thank you. inspiring your talk. Thank you. And, and let's move to the second.